Please sit down. Welcome everyone to our farewell for a beloved teacher, husband, father Hello. and friend, Stefan Harding. My name is Rupert and I am Stefan's undertaker and Julia, Stefan's wife, has asked me to hold this ceremony of praise and celebration and mourning for the life and the loss of Stefan, and I'm honored to do so. We have tributes from dear friends and colleagues, music and poetry, in which to celebrate his singular contribution to shifting our collective vision outward toward the battered organism that is planet Earth before we go to lay Stefan down on the green hill hey, of Sharpen Meadow. You are welcome to join us there, but Good morning. equally welcome to stay here in the Great Hall and the White Heart. On behalf of all who loved him, may I thank you for making the journey. What feels thick in the air today is the inescapable echo between Stefan's death and the closing of Schumacher College, of which he was a founder member. Two were uh, intertwined like a caduceus. This double death has landed hard on our local community and on a global community of scientists and thinkers. It echoes around the world. 
Stefan would, of course, be quick to point out that Schumacher was a collective effort, a combined dreaming of visionaries. And this is so true, yet remove Stefan from the college, and I wonder whether it would have been quite the same place. His nurturing of a bright flame of deep spirituality within the container of biology set the tone for the college and sent legions of scientific mystics into the world burning with passion who continue to bring us the now undeniable truth of our perilous existence and the damage we have done to our mother. The hopes and dreams of Schumacher College continue with the Satish Kumar Foundation. It ain't over. For all our sakes, cannot allow it to be. So today we hold up all of Stefan's life, the personal and the professional, although they are sometimes indistinguishable, and celebrate all he has achieved in his joyful and fulfilling life. There is so much to be grateful for today. So I'd like to ask Satish as our first speaker to come up. Thank you, Rupert. <clears throat> we celebrate the life of our dear friend, Sorry. my dear friend, as well as our dear friend, our colleague, our companion, our teacher, Stefan. Um, in 1990, when I first met Stefan, we interviewed him for being a teacher at Schumacher College. And then Stefan said, Satish, where are you going after this interview? I said, I'm going to North Devon. And he said, oh, I want to go to North Devon. Can I have a lift with you? <laughs> and so I said, I have only a small Morris. You are very welcome. I'm on my own. So he came with me. And as we were driving just out, just the kind of near Buckfast Abbey, car broke down. Suddenly smoke was coming out. And I'm very nervous about technology. But Stefan said, something smoke is coming out, something is wrong, stop. So we stopped. He opened the bonnet and uh, there was something, something small problem, but I didn't know what to do with it. So he went to some nearby looking around and he found a screwdriver and something, 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 and he fixed it. So I said, Stefan, you have got the job. <laughs> so that is my first memory of Stefan. Ever since the first day of Schumacher College, until he died, he was my dear friend, my colleague. We worked so well together. And he, first time met James Lovelock at Schumacher College. And first time he met Arnie Ness at Schumacher College. And, uh, and many, many others, Fritz of Capra, Bandana Shiva, Thomas Berry, Wendell Berry, many, many people. And he embodied Gaia. It was not just an intellectual, academic knowledge that he had, he did. He was intellectually and scientifically and academically very competent and very well-versed. But what impressed me most was that it became part of his blood, part of his bone, part of his spirit, part of his soul, part of his heart. He embodied it. And that's a very rare. Many, many great 
writers, scientists write good books intellectually, they are very clever, they are very profound, but rare to find somebody who embodies the, the, the ideas and the theories that he believes in. And so, I think he made such a great impression on, I would say, thousands of our students. And you are an evidence of this, because you have all come here, many of you were his students and came to Shimahar College as students and as colleagues. And he made that deep impression, inspiring, convincing, and, 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 and a loving, that combination. And he was a scientist, but he was also a mystic. He, he went into the woods and just, he will meditate. And, uh, and he loved poetry of Tagore. And uh, he was so dedicated. And, uh, and he, was, uh, he was a great follower of, of, um, uh, of Jung. And many, many, and his, I encouraged him to write a book, Animat Earth. I said to Stefan, you are a wonderful teacher, but you can't be an authority until you author a book. And say, oh, Satish, there are so many wonderful books. I don't want to write anything. I said, no, no, Stefan, you have to do it. Get on with it. And we'll publish it. <laughs> we'll publish it. And so I published his book, first book, Animate Earth, from Green Books. So I encouraged him. So it was a great companionship and lifelong friendship that I had with Stefan. And one thing which he loved me at almost of teaching him, and, in, and, and inspiring him with, was a Gayatri Mantra. You know the word Gaya in Greek is also Gaya in Sanskrit. And we have a beautiful mantra. In Greek, Gaya is Mother Earth, Goddess of the Earth. But in Sanskrit, Gaya is much more cosmic. And so the mantra goes, Om Bhu Bhuvasva Tatsavitur Varenyam Bhago Devasya Dhimahi Dhyo Yone Prachodayat Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. And he loved this mantra. He wrote it down. He said, please tell me each word meaning. So the, it means that Gaia is earth, sky, heavens, angels, wisdom, Everything what is, is Gaia, the totality, Om. Om means whole, like omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, Om. Om, Om, whole, the entirety is Gaia. That's a very beautiful, much bigger vision than, than Gaia as a kind of just the planet Earth. And so Stefan loved it, and we always sang, and he wrote it down. So we sang this mantra together. And the first course, which we ran with James Lovelock, Julia came as a participant. Who will not fall in love with, with Stefan? <laughs> and who will not fall in love with Julia? <laughs> Julia has been with us at Schumacher College from the very first course. And they were great companions. They were wonderful companions. And then Julia became our great cook and a great mother. You, Julia, are Gaia of Schumacher College. And I always call Julia, uh, St. Julia of Dartington. <laughs> Such kind, Hello. calm, loving, selfless service. So although Stefan has gone, but we are very happy that Julia will continue that work with us. And as death is not the end of life, 
death is the end of maybe this body. But rebirth always continues. Life does not die. So similarly, Rupert said about Schumacher College, there is a new rebirth in the offering of Schumacher College. And I want you to invite you all to be part of that new Schumacher College, a rebirth and the new, we don't know what the reincarnation would be, we don't know how rebirth of Stefan will be, but life will continue, Schumacher College will continue. So I would like to remember with great love and great celebration, of course, sadness and grief is part of that celebration. And we all grieve because he was so dear to us, but we wish him a good next life. And we celebrate together with um, Stefan's passing, but presence of and love of Julia and Oscar. He has left behind him two wonderful, beautiful people who are our friends and our, uh, our uh, great companions. Thank you, Julia, and thank you, Oscar, <laughs> continuing the work of Stefan. And thank you all for being here in such a beautiful uh, celebration. Thank you. Thank you, Satish. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Andrew Proudfoot to come up. Dear friends, good morning. I'd like to tell you a bit about Stefan in the years before you knew him. Our 50 year friendship began in 1972 when we were still boys. We both arrived in Durham as the first hundred or so intake for a brand new college, Collingwood College. But Stefan had left William Ellis School, North London, a year earlier to join an ecological field project in Sengwa in Zimbabwe, radio collaring warthog. In fact, Stefan was a man, and I was a mere boy, aspiring to study birds, and who got no further than Texel on the Dutch coast and a bird ringing station on Lake Neusiedl in Hungary. Stefan was exotic and huge fun. I was a suburban, slightly dull, middle-class boy. <laughs> Alongside Stefan, ambitions exploded. Both of us were very keen to escape into the world and to experience the wild tropics. As you may know, Stefan was born in Caracas to a Venezuelan mother and a Polish father. He was already halfway there. Between many bottles of Newcastle Brown, dancing in the student union, and late nights on the guitar, we plotted our dream of getting out into the jungles of South America. Peru was the destination we chose, and especially the pristine rainforests of the upper Madre de Dios. The Manu area was about to be designated a national park to stave off the disastrous attentions of oil exploration. It is said to be one of the most species-rich areas of all Amazona, with an altitudinal range from Paramo at 4,000 meters to the floodplain at a few hundred meters. I think Stefan was very well connected to the London Zoological Society, which had just bestowed a gold medal for conservation on the Peruvian biologist, Felipe Benavides, along with the improbably named Antonio Brack Egg. They had revived the dwindling population of wild vicuña in the high paramo. Uh, we wrote to these two wonderful men and hatched a plan for a university expedition to provide a photographic inventory of animals in the Manu for publicity purposes. We needed money and logistics help and were so lucky to be in the orbit of the fabulous and very kind David Bellamy. At that time, a renowned botany lecturer at Durham and a TV presenter really a precursor to David Attenborough. Lots of letter writing and begging letters went out to philanthropic funds and the Royal Geographical Society to assemble the necessary cash. 
In the end, there was only just enough funding for Stefan and me. We flew to Lima in the summer of 1974 and then on to Pucallpa for several weeks to study the impact of oil exploration on wildlife. Learning the oil potential of an underlying sediment requires grid lines to be cut into the forest, interspersed with regular shallow drill holes into which explosives were lowered and detonated to generate a seismic wave data map. Teams of men cut these lines and were provided with fresh meat by camp hunters. Stefan and I logged and analyzed the animals they killed. Next, we returned to Cusco and flew out in a Buffalo airplane to Puerto Maldonado on the banks of the Madre de Dios to take a dugout canoe upriver into the Manu. For several days, we passed overhanging trees in Caña Brava, negotiating rapids to arrive in a wonderland of Oxbow Lakes at the new and rudimentary field station at Koshikashu. Paddling out onto the lake in a palm dugout, we used a Canon 400 millimeter lens to photograph monkeys, toucans, and a host of other birds that visited the edge of the lake. We saw jaguar paw prints by the river. This was an overwhelming and intoxicating experience for a couple of 20 year olds. We were marked for life. Neither of us ever the same after it. We'd had a taste of earthly paradise. All other field trips compared to it unfavorably. We both knew we were going back to South America the moment we graduated. In October 1975, we boarded the plane to Caracas to begin our adventures. Stefan not only studied mammals in the Llanos area of Venezuela, but studied painting for a time with a Colombian master in Bogota. I went on to Lima to teach in a British council school and work on a plant breeding project in Brazil. Eventually, Stefan returned to the UK and was accepted for a PhD on muntjac deer at Oxford. He was always transparently a great intellect. Oxford is my hometown, and I still saw lots of him when I returned home to see my mum from teaching in Madrid. Stefan had kaleidoscopic interests and an impish, roaring sense of humour. It was impossible to be bored in his company. Stefan lives in our hearts and minds forever. He was a unique, wonderful, and stupendous human being. His laughter, joie de vivre, and attachment to Mother Earth rings in our ears. In his packed and eventful life, he touched many people. He knew an enormous amount of biology, was an abalient musician, and spiritually a very wise man. Like you all, I loved him very, very much. I will miss him deeply. Hello to everyone. Um, it was wonderful to be taken by Stefan and Julia to see Stefan's goat willow. Uh, I believe I'll get the title right, the elephant mother goat willow. Is that right, Julia? Um, in his garden, uh, not far from here. And it was clear that Stefan not only loved this goat willow, but I think worshipped this goat willow. Um, so I had written a lament for the goat willow, but actually I'm going to change its title to the triumph of the goat willow, because listening to everyone speak today, I really feel Stefan's life and his love for the natural world is triumphant and will be triumphant. All around my hat, I will wear the goat willow and goat willow leaves will make do for my sleeves. I will prop my soul on a goat willow pole, and when the wind moves my cat's paw gloves, and a lacy clearwing wakes in a crack of my winter coat made of goat willow bark, on the bank of a stream in the church of a willow, Sending this prayer to the red yellow wands of the God of the willow to flutter my hands with the thrush songs 
of a willow guitar. I will stare, I will stare, by the second sight of my glasses filled with chlorophyll light. And when I set forth in my shoes of earth, with a purple emperor perched on my finger, I will wear, I will wear my goat willow crown, my goat willow hair and my broadleaf gown. And if anyone should ask me the reason why I'm wearing it, it's all for a man who loved the goat willow and it's all for a willow who loved that man. To have the pleasure of going on a deep time walk with Stefan, or Papagaya, as some of us used to call him, was to explore the unfolding of our earth in the company of a holistic maestro, a captivating storyteller who walked with one foot in scientific rigor and the other in soulful reverence. As many of you will remember, at the start of every deep time walk, a concept originally conceived with his student Sergio, Stefan would ask, how can we possibly understand or comprehend 4.56 billion years, the age of the Earth? It's just a meaningless number, he would say. He would then go on to explain how on a 4.56 kilometer walk, every meter represented 1 million years, every footstep 500,000 years and every millimeter, 1,000 years. <laughs> Stefan used to do that a lot, didn't he? <laughs> well, we might as well pack up our bags now and go home, he used to say. Surely that's amazing enough. Well, this was typical of Stefan's warm, playful, and often mischievous personality, which enabled him to translate complex science into enchanting, memorable, experiences. He had a unique way of enthralling people, whether by evoking mystery and wonder at the moon's incredible formation, celebrating first life with imaginary Schumacher champagne, or inviting a group to embody the evolution of complex cells whilst he role-played the voices of two microorganisms. <laughs> oh, I tasty little bacteria. I won't go on, but uh, you get the idea. He was, well, deep time walking with Stefan was a delight. To cut a very long story short, at the last meter of the walk, Stefan would get on his hands and knees and place a ruler on the ground, explaining how only the last 20 centimeters represented the time since the evolution of our species, Homo sapiens. And then in the last one fifth of a millimeter, the start of the Industrial Revolution. He would then soberly bring into consciousness how human activities are today initiating 
the sixth mass extinction on Earth. This last piercing moment is often called an epiphany or a eureka moment by participants. For Stefan, this was a moment in which people were guyed. A moment when your blinkered anthropocentric temporal horizons were shattered, when you were drawn into a visceral sense of knowing you are a part of this earth, when you realize you are not a passive listener on a 4.56 kilometer walk through 4.56 billion years of Earth history, but an active participant encountering her very unfolding. When you come to know that this deep time story, Stefan's deep time story, is ultimately your own deep ancestral story. When Julia asked how we might bring the deep time walk to today's rite of passage, I decided to measure the distance as the crow flow flies from where we are right now in the Great Hall to the central gathering point at Sharpham Natural Burial Ground where his body will be laid to rest. That distance is 4.56 kilometers <laughs> to the meter. That is, as you know, the exact same distance that Stefan will have walked hundreds of times when he led people on a deep time walk. I mean, how can we make sense of all of that? I mean, I was gobsmacked, or perhaps I should say, I was Gaia smacked. If ever there was a time to invoke the Schumacher exclamation, oh my Gaia, surely this is it. And I hear in the midst of this echoes of Stefan's words describing the formation of our moon. Is it chance? Is it a miracle? Is it something else? I leave you to decide, he would say. For me, I sense in this beautiful synchronicity that is arising an original gift. From whom I'll leave you to decide. But a gift that invites us to not too quickly collapse the phenomena and dismiss it rationally, but instead to allow the mystery and the wonder of it all to be suspended as we continue Stefan's rite of passage today. You know, there's an image of Stefan forming for me, his warm smile, even maybe chuckling in a kind of trickster kind of way. I don't know about you, but I can't help feel we are all being invited to be guided today. In the words of Julia, on 2nd of September, the spirit of Stefan has flown, flown back to become enmeshed in the anima mundi, the soul of our world. And now today, his elemental body is returning back into the body of what Stefan described as the shining, turning, deep blue marble earth in which we live, breathe, and have our being. It is the return of a husband, father, friend, teacher, colleague, and now ancestor back into what Stefan called flesh of our flesh. Our dear friend Stefan came from deep time and is today returning to deep time. I know he will continue to inspire, to guide and to actively shine through all our lives as we walk on. Deep time walking with Stefan has been for me, like so many of us, the privilege of my life. And I believe the Deep Time Walk project we co-founded in 2016, which now has a community of hundreds of facilitators all over the world, will continue to bring this part of Stefan's legacy to life with one foot in scientific rigor and the other in soulful reverence. Papa Gaia is becoming Gaia Papa in the great unfolding symphony of our animate earth. Thank you, Robert, thank you. Stefan was born in Caracas, Venezuela on the 8th of July, 1953, to parents Severin and Estera. 
His parents were of uh, Polish Jewish descent who left Poland for Palestine before moving to Venezuela, where Severin established a successful business making aluminium window frames. They were both quite old to become parents, certainly by the standards of the time, both in their 40s. And to help them raise the child, they employed a Spanish housekeeper, Julia, who adored young Stefan and raised him to speak Spanish, which became his mother tongue. This brief early idyll was shattered when Estera had to travel to London to receive treatment for lung cancer. Tragically, she died on the operating table and her death was concealed from Stefan on the advice of a well-meaning child psychologist. Stefan was three years old. Despite his young age, he soon worked it out. And when Severin overheard Stefan telling another child that his mother was in heaven, the lie was dropped. Luckily, Stefan had a mother figure in the form of Julia, which was of great comfort to him when the second seismic event took place at the age of six, relocation to London. Stefan felt this shock almost more than the death of his mother. The lush tropical vegetation and cobalt blue skies of Venezuela were swapped for the Tupperware grey of England and its dismal parks. The young Stefan would have been dismayed to know he would spend the bulk of his life here, although he would surely be excited to know of the life and the career, the friendships and the family he would establish here in our gloom. But even here amongst our dark satanic mills, there are creatures. And on going to William Ellis Grammar School, his life path was altered by an inspirational zoology teacher. Not only would he open Stefan's mind further to our extraordinary natural world, but he would provide an unconscious template for his own teaching career. Stefan had become transfixed by nature at a very early age, and when his father saw him deep in wonder and communion with the flower, he had a premonition that this piercing curiosity and his apparent instinctive understanding of its complexity would be his life's work. Stefan became friends with a similar zoologist in waiting, Guy Stocker, and together they frequented pet shops and London Zoo, feeding their mutual hunger for the natural world. They formed the West Hampstead Zoological Society with Stefan appointed treasurer and a mission to save the frogs born in the ponds on the heath from being scooped up and put in aquariums led to possibly his finest achievement appearing on the legendary children's television program Magpie, a notable show because the rescued frogs escaped and hopped all over the studio. When he finished at William Ellis, uh, Stefan took a gap year in Africa, where the familiar climate and the wildness of the bush nearly took a permanent hold in his heart. But he returned to England and to Durham University, where he started a zoology degree. Though a brilliant man, as we know, and a more than capable student, Stefan succumbed to the delights of carousing with his fellow students finding love for the first time, making good friends, but ultimately failing to get the degree he should have. Later on, he thought that this wasn't just down to too much partying, but also down to the way that zoology was taught there, dry and reductionist, something he would never be accused of with his own teaching style. As a teacher, Stefan was to combine the playful teasing curiosity of the Tibetan monks he was later to meet with the passion and charisma of an Old Testament desert saint. Stefan ignited imaginations in his students in a way he was denied. After Durham, he returned 
with a friend, uh, I think now that's Andrew, um, to his birth country of Venezuela, working various jobs, making a name for himself as a field researcher, which led to an incredible offer of a job at the prestigious Smithsonian Institute. But fate was to cross his path again when he met two people, an artist called Gonzalo Ariza, and more importantly, a dazzling Norwegian actress called Eva Bastiensen. Inspired by Gonzalo and in love with Eva, Stefan rejected the Smithsonian Institute's offer and stayed in Venezuela with Eva and also their baby daughter, Victoria. The man who offered Stefan the job never spoke to him again. Ultimately, Stefan was to return to England due to his father's fury at this union and Eva let him go. But leaving his daughter in the capable hands of Eva was to haunt Stefan. Many years later, Stefan and Victoria were reunited and rebuilt a loving relationship with a shared passion for the environment. Victoria is with us today, as is Lucy, Severin's second wife. Stefan's stepmother, only seven years older than Stefan, who built back up the heartbroken and somewhat sickly young man that returned. Stefan regained his strength and his purpose, becoming obsessed with Munchak deer, relatively recently escaped from the Duke of Bedford's estate and spreading across the countryside. This species was to become the focus of a seven year doctoral study at Oxford University, a place he was encouraged to apply for by David Bellamy, as we've heard, who taught him at Durham. Stefan thrived at Oxford and tempered his enthusiasm for wild socializing somewhat, helped perhaps by discovering one of the great loves of his life, Tibetan Buddhism. He began to meditate and chant, finding a deep peace and connection that was to be the calm heart of his life, all of his life. Inevitably on leaving Oxford, Stefan traveled to Nepal, spending several months at a monastery, studying and teaching the monks English. Nepal was a place of deep peace and deep learning for Stefan. And he was right to succumb to the philosophical currents of Buddhism, for they were to sweep him to his destiny. Stefan was asked to drive a young monk, Honlop Rinpoche, down to a Buddhist community in Devon at Sharpham House. And after spending a happy few days at Sharpham, he casually inquired as to whether there might be any jobs locally for a young zoologist. He was told that a new international ecological college was soon to be set up at Dartington and a meeting with Satish Kumar and John Lane led to instantaneous friendship and a job as ecologist to Dartington, one of five key members of staff. This can be seen as the point when Stefan's life's work began properly and almost immediately Stefan was introduced to a life-changing idea, that of James Lovelock's theory of Gaia, the earth as living organism, a sentient being rather than dead matter, a flourish interconnected delicate system. And Stefan would of course articulate this idea in his first book, The Brilliant Animate Earth. Stefan would dig deep and see this idea into hundreds and hundreds of students captivating and inspiring them alongside various people, including the charming and charismatic Brian Goodwin, and of course, Jim Lovelock, Satish Kumar, and many more of the great alternative thinkers of our time. Had he known he would stay at Schumacher for 33 years, he might have been dismayed, although that would only be because of our dour climate. 
Stefan yearned for heat. But what he lost in weather, he gained in friendship and love. He was to meet his beloved Julia at Schumacher, and go on to marry and have a son, Ozzy, and to find comradeship among his peers and students alike. Stefan's impact cannot be underestimated. So many of his students have gone on to become leading thinkers and strategists, all dedicated to slowing down the juggernaut of planetary destruction, all dedicated to bringing his delicate holding of grief and hope to a frightened world. And despite his academic brilliance, Stefan was a deeply joyful and playful individual, happiest when strumming his guitar around a fire. The incredible reputation that Schumacher has earned around the globe is in no short measure to the deep erudition and ability to ignite and connect with his students. He is deeply loved and he will be deeply missed. I'd like to invite one of those students, Tom, to come up now. Hi friends, my name's Tom and I was lucky enough to be a student of Stefan's and I'm here today to say a final thank you to my friend and teacher, to a man who changed the course of my life and the course of the lives of so many people in this room. I myself was forever transformed more than 20 years ago, lying on my back, on the grass, in the sunshine, and feeling for the first time my perspective shift for a moment. And I was no longer lying on the grass, but instead was being held by the love of Gaia as she dangled me over the vast sky. As Stefan's words washed over me, I felt the forests, the oceans and the tundras stretching out across the face of Gaia. I opened myself to a deep experience of something that had previously resided only in my head, a seed of connection and of remembering of coming home was planted that day. Much of my life since has been tending to that tree. This story, of course, is simply one of many. Stefan was a superlative teacher, the best I have ever known. His masterful ability to bring us with him into the animate world that he inhabited was a gift that is truly rare. And it was a gift built first on joy. To spend time with Stefan was to fall in love every day, fall in love with beetles and moths and rivers and stinging nettles. When it came to nature, he never lost the enthusiasms of childhood. And through him, we refound them and were transformed. This joy became an act of resistance against the deadening effects of the extractive modern world. It allowed him and he allowed us to come alive again. But it also did something else. It opened us to sorrow. You cannot sensitize yourself to the natural world to the degree that Stefan did without also feeling what's happening to it. The sheep ravaging Dartmoor, the encroachment of development on his home, the drop in migratory birds in Devon, the bleaching of the coral reefs. These were not intellectual outrages to Stefan, but deep wounds. Whereas most of us would harden our hearts and shift to anger and action, that's not how Stefan was made. He wasn't a person who was interested in making compromises with a broken system. That path could only separate him from what he was so deeply connected to. I remember I once made some comment to him about how we need to be practical and strategic in dealing with the modern world. And after a long pause, and a deep sigh, he looked at me and said something that will echo with memory and understanding for many of you, that neither the wolf 
nor the mountain agreed with me. I started by remembering that sunny morning more than 20 years ago when a seed was planted in me by Seven's teaching. That seed has grown into a tree and that tree is just one in a vast forest. Stefan's teaching has self-differenced into a variety of forms that like the face of Gaia are ever-changing. Some of the fruits are close to the world of Stefan's life and will form part of the considerable visible legacy that he leaves us. New models of education, new ways of understanding like Gaian consciousness, and new ways of feeling our place in the vast arc of Gaia, like the deep time walk. We should cherish these, but also realize they are a small part of the fruit growing in the forest of trees that Stefan has planted in us more than 30 years, for more than 30 years. Trying to map that impact is like trying to measure the mist that hangs on the river Dart on an autumn dawn. It seems to vanish under the light of the sun, but deeper understanding reveals it simply become part of the trees, the birds, and the soil. Stefan's teaching has changed forms and become river cleanup projects in Delhi, legal campaigns to push for the rights of nature, huge platforms supported by trillions of dollars, driving companies to measure and reduce their emissions, projects to house and support refugees arriving on boats in Greece, and international global climate agreements. On every continent, fruit from this forest is ripening and people far too numerous and diverse for us to ever track or measure are working in service of our anima earth because of seeds planted perhaps decades ago by a joyful, childlike, sorrowful, beautiful man who we loved, who we will miss and to whom we will always be deeply grateful. Thank you. I wrote these words in the days immediately following Stefan's death. Where to begin? I've had the good fortune to know Stefan and Julia for more than three decades, and Ozzy from about five minutes after his birth. It's been one of the great pleasures, you could say, adventures of my life. <clears throat> Stefan is widely known and respected, of course, as a gifted Gaian scientist and for his very special ability to instill in others his own deep love of nature. In so doing, transforming the lives of countless people around the world. But he was also a great wit, a showman, and an always eloquent conversational sparring partner. Over the years, he and I have lamented the state of the world more times than I care to remember. Uh, Stefan was a very good lamenter. Then, in our own heads at least, uh, put everything right again. We have looked for and found joy in life, not least in Italian cuisine. We have randomly assumed all manner of strange accents. We have disagreed heartily on questions large and small and remained the best of friends. And then there was the music. Stefan and his beloved gaffer taped quattro were inextricably intertwined, co-creating waves of sound, both poignant and life affirming. And who could ever forget his inspired arrangements of Lorca, mi corazón como una sierpe, Sea desprendido de su piel, my heart, like a snake, has shed its skin. Sometimes, many times, we played together. The multiple inadequacies of my recorder technique, thankfully disguised by his sensitivity and virtuosity. Wonderful, memorable occasions. 
I will remember Stefan in so many ways. In his trademark multicolored braces, crouching down, glasses off, marveling at a dung beetle, captivating audiences with his inspirational public presentations, imitating the manners of the British aristocracy, sharing stories of his time spent in the Amazon, and just a few days before his death, educating us on punting etiquette at Oxford. Charismatic, eccentric, passionate, hugely optimistic one day, deeply pessimistic the next. <laughs> Stefan engaged with life in a gloriously unfiltered way. Brilliant, but at times hopelessly indecisive. Just ask the travel agents in Totnes. <laughs> Scientist and poet, introverted, but expansively open to the world. Rest in peace, dear friend. <clears throat> As my husband, John, <clears throat> was just saying, we had the privilege of being close friends with Stefan for more than three decades. And I first met him because I taught the second course at Schumacher, not so well known. Um, and he was already becoming the sort of essence of what Schumacher College became. We differed because he was coming from science and I had become absolutely convinced about the need for local indigenous knowledge systems and cultural diversity. But over the years, starting almost from the very first day, we became soulmates uh, because of our deep, shared, almost religious passion for nature. And I also loved, as my husband did too, his music, his cuatro, particular the vernacular Spanish songs. So we were soulmates, we argued, we played music and were together for, yeah, for these last three decades and in six different countries. He and Julia came out to volunteer in Ladakh where we had started projects, Ladakh or West Tibet. And um, one of the most memorable scenes from that was Stefan enacting the role of a CEO head of a pesticide company. This was part of the plays that we put on written by a local monk and me to counter the development narrative that was being pushed on people, which included bringing in DDT, even though it had been outlawed in the West. Well, Stefan, in this brilliant acting um, as the CEO of a pesticide company, you can just imagine him hamming it up. So because of his acting skills, about a decade later, when we were planning a new documentary called The Economics of Happiness, we were in Australia together, and we had decided to try to make this come alive by having Stefan as a thread throughout the film. And he was going to be playing this conventional scientist who woke up to the big picture of this tragic conflict between science and an economic growth economy based on reductionism that was threatening Mother Earth. And we had a filmmaker friend of us filming these early attempts at Stefan hamming it up and playing out the role of this conventional scientist. And in a break, he was a friend of ours, he said to me, who is this guy? Is he a friend of yours? <laughs> but he Stephen had done such a good job that he couldn't believe that this man could be a friend of ours. Sadly, our attempt was too ambitious, so some of you may know we didn't succeed in keeping that thread in the film. Wish we could. Then later on, um, one of the most memorable and Stefan moments was when we had asked him to help teach a course. We were organizing a course in Spain 
for American college students. And he, as a biologist, was teaching in La Doniana, south of Sevilla. And after a long day out in, in the reserve, in the nature reserve, we went to have a drink in a bar in Sevilla. They were all looking at us a bit suspiciously, these scrubby greenies, who were they? Until Stefan brings out his quattro, and he starts playing a tune that just leads to this gasp in the whole bar. And he was singing a song that all of these people remembered from their childhood that they hadn't heard. So it's Venezuelan, but still in their memories in Sevilla. So they were virtually kissing him at the end of the evening. <clears throat> and then another final um, wonderful memory was right here in Dartington, and we organized a harvest festival to celebrate the local food economy. And I wasn't really sure that Stefan really got it, this link between shorter distances between the farm and the table, and how that was essential for restoring biodiversity. But of course, we invited him to give a talk on this subject. And without any rehearsal or anything, I think, he gave the most brilliant talk ever on the importance of local food systems. And he did it again with his humor and with his incredible and just brilliant genius. He was a brilliant genius. And no one has ever made that speech as well as he did then. So I hope Stefan, I used to call him Babaji. Babaji, I hope you really now get over you, your constant self-doubt and you hear all this love that's coming from all over the world for you. Your love for Gaia, which has created a whole movement where we're all trying to save the world. Thank you. I, I'm really, you know, I didn't, I'm surprised I'm so emotional because we're also very grateful to Stefan because he died slowly enough. So we were together for these last three months very regularly. But I also did want to say as Satish that Stefan would not have been Stefan without Julia. And Julia kept the multiple complex pieces of Stefan together in a way. It's truly remarkable. And she did that virtually for every student at the college. She knew every name, she knew every demand, every, every single person, all these years. Totally Saint, Saint Julia, as Satish was saying. And so I want you and Ozzy to know that you're like family for us and we'll always be there for you. <laughs>
Hello, everyone. So, Stefan and I shared a love for Jung. And in preparation for this little tribute today, I turned to Jung and the archetypes. And there I found Senex, the archetype of the grandfather. So described as a wise sage, someone who's wrestled seriously enough with their anima, someone who has the deepest connection with nature, someone who tells stories in a mystical way so as to mentor others in who they are and who they are to become. An absent-minded professor and even a wizard. I smiled because to me, Stefan was all of these things. Soon after I had my son, who some of you may know, Isaac, I went through an extraordinarily difficult time. A dark night of the soul, you could say, which some of the alumni here may recognize as a familiar experience after leaving the college. A dear friend of mine, another alumni, worried about me. She reached out to Stefan and Julia to check in on me. And Stefan didn't do nothing. He called me. And they invited Isaac and I over for afternoon Sunday tea. Anyone who has ever tasted Julia's cakes will know that that is not an invite that you should ever turn down. <laughs> From then on, they embraced me, us, into their family. And I came to know a side of Stefan that was even sweeter and more heartfelt than I had ever seen before. He would take Isaac off for walks, exploring the rivers, where apparently, by the way, a water dragon lives. <gasps> Much to my little boy's amazement. Isaac, aged three, of course, learned many things from Stefan. And much to my parents' surprise, when playing a game of Guess the Animal with him, he chose a coccolithophore. <laughs> Sunday after Sundays, he and Isaac would go around the grounds of the postern, and more recently, of course, their beautiful garden, keeping alive the magic and awe that children just swim in. Teaching, playing, with mouth ajar, with amazement at every new discovery together. As I know he has done for generations of children who have been lucky enough to pass through the college. Julia would tell me stories about Inga and Alex's daughter, Alana, who loved nothing more than being on the shoulders of Stefan. Him being an elephant with one arm as the trunk, which he would trumpet enthusiastically. When Alana was given a stuffed giraffe as a small child, it had a big nose and a tuft of black hair, and she christened him, of course, Stefan. These moments mean so much to the children with whom he connects with. He allows the world to stay alive to them, to be magical, and to be in relationship with it. And it stays with them. Because recently, upon discovering the plight of the Galapagos turtles, Isaac insisted that he must speak to Stefan immediately because he would know what to do about it. Being with Stefan in this way <clears throat> so naturally, I know that that magic that we all have as children somehow was kept intact for him. The joy and playfulness that the children so easily fall into is the same joy that we as adults and those of us who have had the privilege of him being our teacher comes alive again melting perhaps years of deadening just through his awe and wonder and of course through his guitar playing i want to leave just one story with you because stefan who for the last four or five years something not everyone will know has been for isaac minka kai and osric the secret christmas hippo <laughs> oscar by now stefan's accomplice would stuff an alexa into a classic hippo mask adorn him with clothes and psychedelic lighting <laughs> and would invite the children into a very strange kind of grotto every christmas <laughs> where they would talk unknowingly to stefan 
who had just had to pop out for an urgent call. He would tell the children all the adventures of this strange hippo being and let them ask questions to their heart's content. To them, this is the most natural Christmas tradition. <laughs> but to us, we know it's full of magic, joy, fun, silliness. And they will miss their adoptive grandfather, Stefan, terribly. But I hope that we will all be a little bit more Stefan and be with fun with our children to keep their animism and their spirits alive for the next generations. It's all about life as a rival. What you know what he loves? He loves to have Fox Pecker, the bird, on his back, picking out ticks. And he tells me all about that. Lovely. Tell me another. I, love, I like mouses. You like what? Mouses, did you say? Yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm going to read a poem by Federico Garcia Lorca. Um, it's called Cigarra, which in English means cicada. <clears throat> Cigarra, dichosa tú, que sobre el lecho de tierra mueres borracha de luz. Tú sabes de las campiñas el secreto de la vida y el cuento de la hada vieja que nacer hierba sentía en ti quedó se guardado. Cigarra. Dichosa tú, pues mueres bajo la sangre de un corazón todo azul. La luz es Dios que desciende y el sol brecha por donde se filtra. Cigarra, dichosa tú, pues sientes en la agonía todo el peso del azul. Todo lo vivo que pasa por las puertas de la muerte va con la cabeza baja y un aire blanco durmiente. Con habla de pensamientos, sin sonidos, tristemente cubierto con el silencio que es el manto de la muerte. Mas tú, cigarra encantada, derramando son, te mueras y quedas transfigurada en sonido y luz celeste. Cigarra, dichosa tú, pues te envuelve con su manto el propio Espíritu Santo que es la luz. Cigarra, estrella sonora sobre los campos dormidos, vieja amiga de las ranas y de los oscuros grillos, tiene sepulcros de oro en los rayos tremolinos del sol que dulce te hiere en la fuerza del estillo. Y el sol se lleva tu alma para ser la luz. Sea mi corazón cigarra sobre los campos divinos que muera cantando lento por el cielo azul herido y cuando esté ya expirando una mujer que adivino lo derrame con sus manos por el polvo. Y mi sangre sobre el campo sea rosado y dulce limo donde claven sus asadas los cansados campesinos. Cigarra, dichosa tú, pues te hieren las espadas invisibles del sur. I think it's easy to die and become a ghost, but it's quite something else when you become an ancestor. Something else when you become an ancestor. And just being here now in the room, you feel somebody who's graduating, somebody who's becoming an ancestor, somebody who is a true old gross human being. I think of de Gaulle, and de Gaulle has a lovely line for all of us. He says, every baby's face is proof that God is not yet sick of us. Every baby's face is proof that God is not yet sick of us. Amazing, how did we get so lucky? And I would have been lucky because on the last day that Stefan was here on earth, uh, I was with him for a little bit, with Ozzy and with Julia and with Mona. And actually he looked like a child. 
at that point. He looked like a child. And I think of an Irish expression that when you die, you are setting out on the trail of truth. You are setting out on the trail of truth. And there was no sense at that liminal moment, there was a mist that had come round all over the house, you remember. There was no sense that his adventure was finishing. It was beginning. I mean, amen, 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 ole, ole, ole. So, as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about actually something about Stefan that no one's mentioned yet. He was quite tough. He was tough. He was irascible. He was full of smiles. But the guy had, uh, he had rocks, as we would put it. He was strong. And if he needed to protest, you'd hear him protest. He had a rebel soul on occasion. I had the delight and the absolute privilege to make a book of Lorca poems with him for a few years in the shepherd's hut that Duncan made round the back of Schumacher. When you're young, you want to get projects done as quickly as possible. But as Seamus Heaney says, when you get older, you want to stretch them out. <laughs> the sheer labor, the joyful labor of working with Stefan. And he would come round with his guitar early in the morning and he'd knock on the door and I could hear him coming and he'd be singing and it was always ecstatic. And then he would sing for a bit, he'd play guitar for a bit and he would talk. And I want to say, Ozzy, he was terribly proud of you. Ter I mean, do you see what just the, the lad just did? Boop. You know, this is the graveyard shift, what I have to do now. And every, every woman, every love interest in the Lorca book was you, Julia. Of course it was. Of course it was. So I got to hear about Victoria. I got to hear about Ozzy, Julia, the whole journey that this extraordinary man had been on. And I sit here today, or I stand actually, and I think about how healthy Stefan is. I actually think about how healthy Schumacher is, actually. The stuff up the hill, that's money stuff. It's just money stuff. The soul and the integrity of both of these characters are, as you said, woven together. It's in good shape. It's in good shape. So I'll read the poem, and uh, as I said, it, it, I think there's a little, a few secrets that Stefan puts in this poem about his own life. Cicada, you are blessed. On the earth's bed, you die drunk with light. From the open fields, you learnt life's secrets. From the open fields, you learnt life's secrets. And hidden in you is that old fairy tale which feels the grass grow. Hidden in you is the old fairy tale that feels the grass grow. Cicada, you are blessed, for you die beneath the blood of an all-blue heart. And light, light is God descending, and the sun is the crack through which it pours. Cicada, you are blessed, for you feel in life's agony all the heaviness of blue. Through death's door, all that is alive will pass, and proceed with bowed head and an air of sleepy whiteness. Thought chatters without sound somberly covered with the silence that is death's blanket but you charmed cicada spilling sound you die and are turned into sounds and heavenly lights cicada you were blessed the holy spirit of light wraps you in his cloak the holy spirit of light wraps you in his cloak cicada singing star over the sleeping fields old friend to frogs and dark crickets, you have sepulchres of gold in the trembling rays of the sun, sweetly wounding you in the power of summer. The sun takes your soul to turn her into light. May my heart be cicada upon the divine fields. So when I die, I want to die singing slowly, wounded by the blue sky. And when I am already dying, may a woman who I glimpse, pour my heart with her hands to spread across the dust. And may my blood upon the field actually become rosy, a sweet mud as tired country folk drive in their hose. Cicada, you are blessed, 
wounded as you are by invisible swords of the blue. Thank you. I'm not David Abram, but I know that David can translate himself into the, into the body, into the consciousness of a raven. And so I'm trusting that he will be here. In fact, we had an email exchange and he agreed to be here as a part of a kind of trilogy of himself, myself and Stefan. So we'll see how it goes. I just want to say one very, very brief thing of my own about Stefan. The most mobile face I think I've ever seen from grief and deep concern to joy and laughter, just like that. So. For my dear brother and ally, gosh, Stefan, I am so darn grateful that I got to visit with you there at Yana Hayloft a week before your passing, that I got to spend a day and a half with you and with beautiful Julia and the ever so dashing Oscar. I still sense your hands in my hand even now Feel the paper thin skin of your arms, the press of your body. I cannot quite believe you are gone. When I first arrived to teach at Schumacher in the mid 90s, I met this dapper biologist in residence who conversed with such playful and passionate concern for this breathing planet he called Gaia and whose teachings were infused with so much open-hearted curiosity for the creaturely lives unfolding all around us that he easily transfixed my students and transfixed me as well his words weaving their way into our nervous systems altering our felt sense of the whole project of science in stefan's company natural science no longer seemed a coolly detached investigation of a world held at a distance but a passionate and participatory engagement undertaken by two-legged animals who were themselves entirely a part of the earthly world that they pondered, an investigation pursued in full alliance with the various beings that one studies in hopes of gleaning insights that will be of service not just to humankind, but to the polyphonic life of the biosphere as a whole. I was already a convinced animist, having spent some time among several place-based indigenous peoples, imbibing their unspoken assumption that everything is alive, not just animals and plants and fungi, but also rocks and rivers and mountains and weather patterns. Yet I felt exceedingly alone and quite lonely in this way of perceiving things, which was often ridiculed as regressive or simply insane by my fellow philosophers and cultural ecologists. But in those first conversations with Stefan and in his luminous articulations of Gaia theory for our students there at Schumacher College, I felt a familiar quality, a rigorous intelligence already sliding toward a much more inclusive sense of life and awareness. Nonetheless, Stefan was reluctant to allow that rocks and rivers were actually alive. And so I tried to nudge him to go all the way, tried to tickle him, to give up striving to fit his scientific insights into the more accepted conventional terms that separated matter from spirit, and instead to adapt a more animistic ontology, wherein any objective presence, like even a boulder or a gust of wind, could be recognized as a being with its own us and to teach it off the world and then there was one moment a few years after we first met when I was sitting listening to Stefan speak at an environmental conference up in Norway and I abruptly realized from his way of speaking 
that he had stepped whole hog and wholeheartedly into the animist camp. And I felt that long and forlorn loneliness simply fall away as though I was shedding a layer of skin. I was no longer alone with this madness. Now, there were two of us. Today, there are thousands of us in many different fields and disciplines. But at that time, apart from our eloquent allies within traditional indigenous communities, one could easily count all the contemporary scholars or theorists or scientists who shared this animistic conviction. There were exactly two of us, Stefan and myself. <laughs> we soon formed the Alliance for Wild Ethics, or AWE, or with two audacious colleagues there in Norway, the eco-psychologist Per Espen Stockness and the eco-philosopher Per Ingvar Haukeland. And the four of us all became tight friends. We kept apprised of one another's creative projects by conversing regularly online via Skype. And we sometimes came together in person, usually in Norway, to collaborate and teach together and to visit Anna Ness, our elder comrade in creaturely wildness and then to backpack up into the mountain heights to camp and explore the wild back country together. Once, in the middle of winter, the four of us took off trekking into the high snows, me and the two Norwegians on skis, with Stefan dancing and prancing around us on a fine set of snowshoes. Once we finally chose a spot in the frozen forest for our base camp, Per Ingvar and Per Espen carved huge bricks out of a packed snowbank and fashioned a splendid winter kitchen and fireplace around which we arrayed our tents and hammocks. Like all of our adventures, that winter trip felt like a strange kind of heaven. By day, we roamed the high ridges and the frozen lakes. At night, we recited beloved poems to one another around the flames, whose heat was doubled by the reflective wall of ice behind the fire. Stefan regaling us with the Spanish eloquence of Garcia Lorca and Antonio Machado. Then he haltingly translated their Iberian music into English. In between those various gatherings of the Alliance, Stefan and I often called one another, and he became, for me, the most soulful of comrades. In long, winding phone conversations, we shared our befuddlement at the ordinary magic of the terrestrial realm, describing our most recent encounters with spiders and salamanders and spawning salmon, with the inscrutable habits of oak trees or the autumn bugling of an elk herd near my home. We consoled one another in our grief at the compounding assaults made by civilization on the collective life of the land, wondering how through our teaching or writing we might alter the trajectory of this hell-bent society. We compared notes on our personal lives too and offered each other necessary solace as we struggled with the chronic illnesses that we each had to deal with. We both knew that to live in full solidarity with the earth to stay sensorially attuned to the often exuberant yet also darkly difficult beauty of the more than human terrain entailed that we also had to carry in the microcosm of our bodies some share of the felt anguish that the many voiced biosphere was undergoing in this era. And so we recognized our own corporeal aches and pains as a way of keeping faith in our smaller bodies with all that the breathing earth our larger flesh was going through. The loving tenderness with which Julia held Stefan, easing his worries while protecting his keen sensitivities, was as integral to Stefan's pedagogical brilliance as water is to a wildflower, just as Oscar's hooligan creativity was necessary nourishment to his father's wild and ever mischievous soul. Stefan loved his family with utter abandon, yes. But if one also gives one's heart to the living land as ferociously as my brother gave his heart to the animate earth, then when such a person passes out of this world, well, he or she does not really go anywhere else at all. Their death, rather, is a strange process of unwinding, of unfurling, of gradually turning themselves inside out. 
the loving and luminous intelligence that was located within one's skin, now slowly opening itself outward, flowing back into the soil and the waters and the winds, insinuating itself back into the swoop and glide of a swallow, infusing itself into the sly, savvy and stealth of a fox and the papery rattle of dragonflies and the loopy, leaping antics of a stoat stalking a rabbit. You are more and more around us now, my bodacious brother, and we can glimpse you shape-shifting among the cumulus clouds. We can now hear your voice in the sigh of the wind through the high grasses and in the splashing speech of the river dart as it gushes over the guttural stones. Even in North America, where I sit writing these words in the high desert foothills of the Rockies, I can hear you easily in the chatter of aspen leaves now turning gold on the flanks of the mountains above town. I know that you are here, my comrade, unfurling yourself across the many bioregions of this earth, free at last to merge back into the radiant planet you so loved, your giddy and foolhardy love riding the exploratory tips of mycelium through the soil underfoot. I can feel you adding your zany laughter and your intuitive genius to the air that we breathe as it whooshes around the planet, ensuring that more and more of us will be Gaia, that ever more of us will fall in love outward with the shadowed wonder and the joyous grief and the darkly dangerous beauty of this whirling world. Thank you, dear brother, for letting the animate earth sing through you. Thank you for your kindness for your vulnerability, for your boundless generosity. Thank you for pouring so much heart into what really and truly matters. Blessed be, beloved friend. I'm about to share a secret with you, a secret that I kept for the last nine years at Stefan's request. Back in 2015, I was invited by Satish to study here, holistic science. I didn't have the money to pay for it, but I accepted anyways. And I started a crazy crowdfunding campaign to be able to pay for my studies. When it was one month to the deadline for me to pay the 5,000 pounds left, I was already very exhausted emotionally to do that. And Stefan was my supervisor. Then I was in his office with him in one afternoon. And he looks at me and say, Karina, you know, don't worry if you can't make it because you can go back to Brazil and do your work with this postgraduate degree. It's already going to be good for you. When he says that, I start crying nonstop, desperate by his side. And I say, you don't understand. I didn't put all the money on my life to study here. I'm not crowdfunding to go back to Brazil with a postgraduate certificate. I need to do the master's degree because the Amazon rainforest wants me to do the master's degree. <laughs> then at this exact moment, he looks at his computer, points out to me, look back at the computer and say, well, I've just received an email when you said that. Take a look at the title of the email. Title of the email, a call from the Amazon. <laughs> he looks back at me. Let me just see if I know who sent this. No, I don't know who sent this. Oh, this is too much of a synchronicity. The Amazon rainforest may be telling me to help you. Look. James Lovelock got a prize once, and he shared the money amongst a group of people. And he told this group of people, 
invest in those who take care of Gaia. I'm going to help you. I'm going to pay the 5,000 pounds left. Study. Don't cry anymore. And work for the rainforest. Let's keep this as a secret between us. And I'm just sharing this because Julia asked me to. <laughs> Otherwise, I would, keep, I would have kept the secret with me. <sighs> Stefan was the best teacher I've ever had in my life. The one who believed me most. <laughs> and in a way of honoring his trust in me, I kept him knowing everything I was doing for Gaia throughout these years. And as usual, I would write him emails. And once I heard he was about to fly through eternity, I wrote him an email because I had to let him know that he was quoted 13 times on my first book. And I'm going to read a little bit of this email to you as part of what I wrote in the book. And we exchanged this email a little bit more than a week before his flight. One day, after one of the many deep time walks I participated in, I felt really bad. I felt low, like sad, thoughtful, reflective. Stefan told me that in about 500 million years, our sun will explode. And when that happens, our planet will cease to exist. Stefan, I said softly, deeply reflective in my inner silence. Does that mean that everything we're doing to help the planet and save ourselves won't matter in the end because the planet is going to die anyway? I remembered the Amazon rainforest, my years of activism, my entire process of recovering from burnout, which was still ongoing when I studied. And I remembered everything I've done for Gaia. An emptiness hit me, a reality check. But upon hearing his response, I connected with the wisdom of what Stefan brought. He said, yes, one day the planet will die, but everything we do and live here, everything we learn and evolve, every good thing we do here on Earth and for the planet, Karina, we resonate through eternity, throughout the entire universe. Everything we do here will resonate through eternity throughout the entire universe. Dear teacher, everything you've done here will resonate through eternity throughout the entire universe. And we will keep up with your legacy. This is a promise. And I want to share with you a little bit of his response. Because he did respond to me. And this bit of what he shared, I feel it's not only to myself. It's to each one of us who are guidance and who passionately work and give our souls in service of our beloved planet. So what he says to me, I would like to invite you all just to close your eyes for a bit. So these words may enter your souls as well. He replied, I encourage you 
to keep going in your great efforts to take care of our planet and also to find great strength and happiness for yourself in the process. With much love and blessings, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karina. Thank you so much, everybody who has spoken or performed today. Um, that concludes this part of our ceremony for Stefan. Uh, we will remain here for a bit. I'm not sure if the timings in your order of service are quite right. Um, you're welcome. Stefan will stay here. You're welcome to come up and pay your respects to him in his beautiful uh, felt cocoon. We're all going to be taught a song by Robin to sing together as Stefan has carried out, so please stick around to, to learn that. And there are grab bags full of um, sandwiches and juice and apples, either to bring to Sharpen or to eat here. Thank you.